uh, to our third talk here this evening. Um, welcome those that are on WBTB. We believe the Bible 107.9. And those of you that are live streaming, we welcome you and we thank you for coming to join us also. Uh, we are in a study this, this week of our third fruit of uh, peace. And if you'll turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Of course, we're going through the tall law book. Uh, Brother Turnton has put this together. It's a second. It's a companion to the second portion of your challenge book of the Uphold Study Course. Uh, tall Law was developed. The book of the Tall Law was developed by Brother Currington to help those that have a Christian background and education, or know the have grown up in churches even, and they know how to perform or act to do the right things, but they don't have the application. So this is a way of breaking down the application. Certainly we know we, have, we live in a world that has laws, and the laws are enacted to many things to be broken. We only enact laws so that we can break them, but they're to give us guides and, and ways to behave. But certainly there's a, there's a law on speeding. But I can pretty well say that anybody who has driven here has broken that law fairly easily, and we don't think much about it. <coughs> But that's what laws do. They just show us that we cannot keep them. And that's the whole reason of the law. That's the whole purpose of the Old Testament was to show us through the law in our rebellion that there is no way that we can keep the law and be justified before God, a, a just and holy God. Um, so this tall law book that <clears throat> says when we're trying harder to do better isn't good enough. When we try in our own flesh, in our own way, in our own in God, not a way God's management system, we fail. We fail miserably. But God has a system of management that he has ordained from the beginning of, the, of creation that we've gotten away through our rebellious nation, nature. And it deals with the, the tri-parts of ourself. And we've been talking about it. We shared that we, have, we are made up of three parts. We are made up of the flesh. Our, our physical being, that's, that's who we are standing right before us. But our physical being, God has instilled into us a soul. And our soul is our mind, our will, and our emotions. What we think, what we... <coughs> what we do, and how we feel about it. And then there's a third part, it's our spirit. Now our spirit, because of our rebellion in the Garden of Eden, is dead. It's trespasses and sin. God has separated us from his fellowship and our, has put our spirit to death. But when we accept Jesus Christ as our Savior, God has made a way by paying a sin debt that we deserve to pay, that's why our spirit is dead, through his son, Jesus Christ, he has made our spirit become alive again. We are renewed. And that's, that's at that point we can have fellowship with God because God is a spirit. And the only way he can, we can fellowship with him is to be in a spirit. And we must have a spirit. Our spirit must be made alive. And that's when we get saved. And that's, that's the beginning of the Reformers Unanimous program. Many programs, recovery and alcohol or addictions programs, our 12-step program so that you can obtain sobriety. Well, at Reformers Unanimous, we here believe that Reformers Unanimous is a one-step program. We need to have salvation and, and trust in Jesus Christ as our Savior so that we can begin the restoration process of having our spirit made alive and we can begin to fellowship with God and His Spirit and His truth. And therefore, we can grow and we can obtain freedom and not just sobriety, but freedom from the sins and the addictions and the stubborn habits, the strongholds in our lives through Jesus Christ. That is the program. If you'll turn with me here into 2 Timothy chapter 3. Of course, the first two weeks ago we were talking about, or three weeks ago, we were talking about the first fruit of the Spirit, which is love. And we talked about joy last week. We had a great time of joy in the joy. But this week we're going to talk about peace. If you look with me in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 10, I will read, Paul writes to Timothy, But thou hast fully known my doctrine, my manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience. Now, Paul's describing to Timothy the things that Timothy has saw in Paul. Verse 11, persecutions, afflictions, which came to me at Antioch, in Iconium, in Lystra, what persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. 
Verse 13. Well, verse 12. Yea, and in all that I will all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, that, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Let's bow for a word of prayer there. Dear Holy Father, we thank you once again for your word, your truth, Lord, that we can know the things that Paul has suffered, but we can learn from them today. Lord, we ask that we've come before you with uh, humbled spirits, open ears, soft hearts, and we may receive from you the word. Lord, do you find myself empty of myself, cleansed of sin, filled with the Holy Spirit to bring forth the message you've prepared through me, Lord, that I am that servant, that able messenger that you've prepared, but also those that are in the congregation, the students that are here, those that are listening on the radio and watching on the internet can receive from you the word tonight from heaven. Lord, and explain it in a way that they can apply it to their lives. Lord, we thank you for, for loving us. May everything we say and do bring honor and glory to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Fruit of the Spirit here we see is, is peace, to be safe from harm in spirit, mind, and body. Paul here is describing here in Rome or in Timothy to the things that had happened. And we are given as an example, Paul, and we see that the life in, in, the, in the scripture and what he has written, written to us, his life, but he's sharing to his young protege, the Timothy, um, the next one up to carry on the banner for Christ, the things. He was bringing them to remind us. And we are, should be the same way. We should see these things. But Paul here was talking about we shall suffer persecution. We will always need peace in our daily lives because there's always going to be persecution in our lives. Paul told us in, Tim in Timothy here that if we live a godly life, we can expect to receive persecution. The world that we live in is at enmity with God. If we claim Christ, we're going to suffer persecution from the world. Understand that. That's a fact. That's a scripture that's in there. We see that. That's a truth. It cannot be denied. Persecution in the 21st century is the most misunderstood of Christian experiences. Persecution defined simply is the pursuit of the perp for the purpose of oppression. When we think of persecution, of course, we all, a lot of us will go back to the great martyrs. We're going to be beheaded, we're going to be stoned, we're going to be burnt at the stake, we're going to be chased out, run out of the country, we're going to be put to death. But no, the Bible tells us and assures us that we are going to be pursued for the purpose of oppression. Satan doesn't like us. Satan doesn't like God, and he doesn't like the ones that accept God and chase after God. He's going to seek to oppress us. Because of that, his way is to pers persecute us. Failing to understand that persecution keeps us from truly understanding, failing to understand persecution keeps us from truly understanding the need for peace and the role it plays in our daily lives. Others' pursuit for the... <coughs> Others' pursuit for the oppression of the Word of God and the growth of God's people. Others are out there to oppress God and to oppress us and put us out and put God away from us. We see that in the world we live in, how they've removed the heritage of our very country that has made it great, they've removed God from all the tenants. They want him out of our public buildings for the name not to offend. Who are we offending? Who are we afraid of? God offers the fruit of the Spirit peace, but as Christians we will suffer persecution. Satan wants to render us useless for the cause of Christ. Therefore, he has established the fruit of, or the work of the flesh, worry. To live in fear of harm in your spirit, your mind, and your body. Satan has a way to discourage us and to get us to run. If we worry about our spirit or our mind or our body, we're distracted 
from living in peace. Persecution can include physical pain or even death in our lives. The death not of us, because death for us doesn't mean we're going to be in heaven, but death of those around us. Our parents, our children, our brothers, our siblings, cousins, people that we love, friends, family. Sometimes we don't understand. And many hold to. Why did God take them? And we become worrisome that we may die. Certainly it was my worry about what was going to happen to me and my family that brought me to the Lord before I was saved. I started to wonder with the death of my grandfather, where was this life going? What was I doing? What was going to happen if I were to die? It began the thought process to I became open to the word of God. But once I accepted salvation and once I knew God as my personal savior, I no longer fear death. I no longer worry about what's going to happen to me. I do not have. I have a peace because I have a promise from the word of God of what will happen to my, myself. The devil is out to persecute all spirit-led believers that are serious about following God. The closer we walk with God, the stronger the attacks. Because if we're tight against the power and the strength of God... Satan has to come at us harder and faster and from more directions to distract us, to try to pull us away from God. He wants nothing more, and it's not just to destroy us. We are nothing to him other than that we are the fact that we are God's apple of his eye. He wants to discredit God. That's what Satan's goal is. He's selfish, and he thinks him to be equal to God and to be as God or even greater than God. We are just a tool to discredit God. First, he doesn't want us to get saved because then he has victory. He has gained us into hell with him. We don't ever accept Christ. But the moment we do, we have lost, he has lost that battle forever. But he can, he can win little skirmishes along the way by, disc, by getting us to stumble and fail and discredit God to those that are around us. Our sphere of influence, those that we have contact with, if we're not walking for Christ, we can cause others to fall. That's Satan's goal. That's his mission. Paul suffered much persecutions because he followed God's system of management to deal with the circumstances and the shortcomings of others. Certainly, a lot of the works of the flesh, we, can, we, we, we apply them to ourselves because we're looking at others' shortcomings. We certainly show frustration at others. Well, they, they can't do this. They shouldn't do this. They won't do this. We start getting frustrated instead of having joy that all life circumstances. God has given me a joy. He's given me peace because I'm free from harm. I am in God's hand. I am upheld with his righteousness. I have a great peace. I have no need to worry. No need to fear What's going to happen to me? Because God's in control. In the Bible here, Paul lists three different places that he suffered persecution. Turn with me to Acts chapter 13. First, he faced persecution at Antioch. Acts chapter 13, verses 44 and 45. Acts chapter 13. Verses 44. And the next Sabbath day came almost and the next Sabbath day came almost the whole city together to hear the word of God. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. Paul was able to share the gospel, share the word of God as a Jew to the Jews, the people that believed in God and loved God. But when he spoke, he had the power of God upon him. So therefore, the people were moved to come and hear the word of God speak, spoken. And when those that were the religious leaders saw the crowds that had drawn almost the whole city, 
they became envious because they couldn't do that because they weren't operating in the spirit of God. They didn't have the power upon them. So the first thing they do is they're going to cut down the man because they can't cut down God. They're powerless against him. But they went after the man. He was contradicted and blasphemed by the Jews, the religious leaders, because of their jealousy. Their jealousy. Paul and Barnabas, he was with Paul at this time, experienced criticism from the Jewish people who loved God because they did not believe in Jesus Christ as the Messiah. They knew about him. He was spoken in the Old Testament, which is the law, given to the Jews and the religious people. They understood, not only as a called people of God, but also as a nation, as a culture. They understood, and they looked for the Messiah. They saw the signs and wonders. They knew it. They had a knowledge of the word of God, but yet they refused to apply it when Jesus came. Jesus was the application of Scripture. Just as this life is the principles that we operate on, the fruits that we seek to, to, to share in our lives are the operation of knowledge that we are given from the Word of God. Paul was saved from harm in his spirit, his mind, and body. When he was called out, he was blasphemed and contradicted publicly by, the, by his brethren. Remember, Paul was a Jew also. He did not fret in his mind. He did not get emotional. And he did not fear the, for the protection of his body. They were just saying words. But he knew the truth. So he didn't have to worry what was happening to him. At this point, Paul had suffered a non-physical persecution at Antioch by the jealous religious leaders. When you start as fledgling, as babes in Christ, as your beginning walk, do you fret and worry about what somebody else is going to say about what you're doing? How your life is changing? The stand you're going to take in your new life in Christ? Are you worrying about what those around you are going to say? Do you worry over the, the gossip, the verbal persecutions? And because of them, do you, do you often want to quit living a godly life? Sticks and stones may break your bones, but words will never hurt you. Isn't that a lie that we learned as a child? Because words do hurt. When your friends, your family say, oh, you're just a nutcase. You're a Jesus freak. You're a Bible thumper. Does that hurt sometimes? Because these are people you spent time with. They knew your old self. Are you willing to give up what Christ has given you? to go back and live that with them in their lifestyle, to be accepted of men. Paul's second persecution was Iconium. Turn over to Acts chapter 14. Acts chapter 14, verses 1 through 7. And it came to pass at Iconium that they went both together into the synagogue of the Jews. That's Paul and Barnabas. And so spake that a great multitude of both the Jews and also the Greeks believed. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and made their minds evil affected against the brethren. Long time therefore abode they speaking boldly in the Lord, which gave testimony unto the word of his grace and granted signs and wonders to be done by their hands. But the multitude of the city was divided in part held with the Jews, in part with the apostles. And when there was an assault made both of the Gentiles and also of the Jews with their rulers to use them despitefully and to stone them, they were aware of it and fled unto Lystra and Derbe, cities of Lyconia, and into the region that lieth round about. And there they preached the gospel. We see here that the there was a division, the believers and the non-believers. We see here that it was not just the Jews that believed, but also the Gentiles, us, those that weren't of the Jewish heritage. Paul was getting people saved, and there become that dividing. Isn't that the divide we still have today? Those that believe and those that don't. And that's, the, that's our separating point. 
but he was effective on who he was ministering to. Paul was able to go to the people and minister unto them. That's where the hatred comes. That's where the derision comes from. That's where the basis of his persecution was because he was effective in ministering to the people of the world and getting them saved. The persecution was more serious here at Antioch. As this time, there was also a threat of physical violence. It was more than just saying some words behind your back or whispering or something. It was in your face, Paul. You need to stop this. They were all up into him, turning red. You could see the, the, the spit coming out of their mouth. And like, oh, I'm going to get you. Just mean the, the hatefulness about it. He wanted to use them despitefully, the Bible tells us. Despitefully is defined as a reproach that attempts physical injury. They were invading Paul's personal space to try to scare him. They were gathering the masses. But Paul responded with peace, and he, which led him to face persecution without worry or fear. He grabbed a hold of it. He was safe in his, his spirit, his mind, and his body. And he was able to step back and minister. God, his hand was on the ministry of Paul and Barnabas, despite the verbal persecutions. The mob wanted to stone Paul and Barnabas, so they, being led by the, <coughs> the fruit of the Spirit, peace, retreated to avoid a riot. They had that mob mentality going on. Those that didn't believe started with a few hateful words, got a few people to believe, got them riding high on their emotions and stirring them and stirring them into this frenzy so that they were circling around Paul and Barnabas. They were starting to yell and scream. Think about it. We have, you've seen pictures of rock concerts, mosh pits, people getting hurt from the mob, just getting so involved in the motions of the sound and the music that people get trampled to death, get crushed under the weight of a amassing push against the stage. What about it at, at sporting events? Certainly we see soccer games on the world level, football as the world calls it, of where the one team would riot against the other when the teams win. The, these players are playing a game, and the, the, the audience, the, the crowd, gets so round up that they start just writhing, and they tear down fences by the pushing on people and running people over and stomping and stambling. Or how about over a cause? Something that gets blown totally out of proportion. A man that says it was abused by police brutality, caught on video, and nobody understood it. Causes a city to stir. Next thing you know, the people are yelling and chanting and screaming, and all of a sudden they start setting fires and overturning cars and breaking down and looting businesses that had nothing to do with the initial assault. This is the crowd that was going on. The Jews were stirring the emotions and welling them up, and people were doing things that had nothing related to what was going wrong. They just wanted to, to destroy. Can you, can you picture the frenzy that Paul was facing? He's traveling with a, pack, with a few men of disciples, and you have crowds coming at you from cities, threatening him. But he was at peace. He wasn't fearful for his mind, for his spirit, for his body. The Lord led him out. And he was still an effective minister. We've seen that. And there they preached the gospel to the regions around. They were still ministers. The third persecution that he, he, Paul mentioned was in Lystra. Turn with me to Acts. Still in Acts there, but we're going to go down to 19. And there came thither, verse 19 here, Acts 9, 14, 19. Acts 14, verses 19 and 21, through 21. And there came thither certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium who persuaded the people, and having stoned Paul, drew him out of the city, supposedly he had been dead. Howbeit, as the disciples stood around about him, he rose up and came into the city. And the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derbe. And when they had preached the gospel to that city and had taught many, 
They returned again to Lystra and to Iconium and Antioch. Those same troublemakers that he faced in Antioch and Iconium caught up with Paul again. They pursued him for reason of oppression. They caught up with him at Lystra. And they had worked their hatred and their frenzy up to him past that they actually stoned him. They threw rocks at him until he was dead. And then they drug him out of the city to leave him to die for dead. Our past may, will continue to come back up to us in order to distract us from serving God, to per persecute us. Things we do in our past will come back. Things we did in, in secret, things we did, they'll certainly will come back. And he'll come back with a vengeance because Satan will use them in ways that will hurt us to we just want to die. In this one we see that Paul's the persecution was physical because they had stoned him. They went beyond just yelling at him. They went beyond just scaring him off or trying to run him off with threats. They actually stoned him and left him for dead. Paul was revived by the Lord and went right back into the city and preached even more. Because he wasn't fearful. He wasn't worrying about what was going to happen to him. He already been stoned. What more could they do? The Lord raised him up. God gave Paul an unbelievable measure of peace. Just what on an un unbelievable measure? Could you do that? Do you think we could do that? We certainly couldn't do it in our own, ourselves, in our own flesh. After being yelled at, scared at, threatened, mobbed, stoned, to get back up and say, I'm going to go back into there and preach them some more so they hear the word. Our flesh wouldn't. Our flesh would be weak. Oh, my back is sore. My head is sore. All these rocks hit me. Paul was free from worry of harm to his, mind, his spirit, his mind, his body. So much so he had no fear of man. He feared the Lord and served the Lord. Paul's message was, do not worry. Don't have fear. Do not retaliate. retaliate. We need to plunge into God's perfect peace and boldly continue what God leads us to do. Turn with me back to 2 Timothy, chapter 3. Second Timothy, chapter 3, we're going to look at verses 13 and 14. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But Paul tells Timothy again, But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. Do you see here the two forces at work? In these three examples that were given to us, the outside forces did not get the result they were after. They did not stop Paul from sharing the gospel being a testimony for Christ, did not saw, stop him from being a Christian. And in doing so, they had to increase the strengths of their attack, thinking that they had won. They were looking to shut down God's message and his messenger by increasing. And when they couldn't get the results, they went to the next level. That's what persecution is going to face us. When, those, when we are acting in, in our spirit-led life, Satan's going to come at us. And if he can't just knock us down with something simple, he's going to try the next one harder and keep coming after us and keep coming after us. But we also see the other part. Do you see the other part? As Paul exercised the fruits he had learned through the Word of God, God allowed stronger attacks so Paul would grow and increase those very same fruits. He exercised. He worked these fruits out. His salvation. He worked them out so that he was stronger. 
He took a, a verbal attack. He was able to withstand that because he exercised the fruit of peace. So the next time God allowed a verbal attack and a more threats of violence, he worked it out and resolved it in peace. Different results, right? The first time he was stood and preached, the second time he, he backed away because he didn't want to invoke the riot, but he still shared the gospel. The third time he was actually physically put to death. Much stronger attack on him, he strengthened himself and went right back into the city and preached again. Same results. Paul was continually working that freight, that the fruit, and strengthening himself. It's all about the attitude of how we see it. We could sit there and read them stories and say, why did God allow Paul to go through that? Satan was winning these battles. Or we could look at it as like God was strengthening a man of God that he already had laid his hands upon greatly to pen much of the, the New Testament. Paul already had God's hand, but he gave it to us for an example of what God can do in our lives. When we exercise and we work it out, we can have the, the greatness of the fruits. But too often we prefer the work of the flesh, the worry. There is nothing more hypocritical to a lost person than a self-centered, frustrated person who calls himself or herself a Christian. Those that are living in the flesh, but we call ourselves the religious Christian. The lost world finds someone who loves unconditionally, expresses great joy in life's adversities, and exhibits a peace that surpasses the understanding in the face of opposition, a mystery and a great draw of comfort. I had a man once, many times over the years, to see how I operated, would ask me, how do you do what you do? There's the witnessing. There's the testimony, my testimony for Christ. I was able, he said, I don't understand how you do that. How you can do my job, and it was job related, dealing with people. Well, that's where us Christians, that's where our godly life is, we have to deal with people. And people are the most stubborn thing to deal with. But he would ask me how I, would hand, how I handle it, what I, what I did to handle it. Perfect door to open up. Christ did that for me. Only because Christ am I have the power to do this. So much so, that man, on his deathbed, asked that I would give that message at his funeral. Why I do what I do. He saw in me the fruits of the Spirit. He wanted others to know about it. He couldn't say it himself, but he wanted others to know. It confounds the world. If we can love unconditional, without self-love, if we do things because of the willing sacrificial giving of oneself without the thought of return that's against the world the world is all about me what am i going to get back when i give this away the world gives greatly to charitable causes thinking that they're going to get salvation that's how they're going to buy their way to heaven that's how they're getting it because i do good things self-love but when we do it selfishly unselfishly it confounds the world it confounds the loss. When we go through hardships, trials, and tribulations in our lives, and people are watching and see how we react and act, it confounds them when we can do it with joy, with peace. But they also use that as a comfort. They draw on us. They'll draw close to us. They'll come alongside us when, we, when we're exhibiting the fruits. They may not want to hear the gospel all the time, but they'll draw alongside us because we can exhibit and we can share the peace with them. I know many of people that come along just to, just they're on the edge or fringe Christians even, but they'll come along somebody that is walking with the Lord to draw from their strength. That should be our testimony. A Christian is frustrated and worried when they live under the influence of the soul rather than the spirit. What we think, what we do, 
how we feel about it. Such people will, only, will not only fail to experience the joy of the Lord, but also the fruit of peace. Because you add to the flesh. Remember we were talking about the, good, the fruits of the Spirit and the bad works, but the, the good works of the flesh? Those are part of that works of the flesh. Christians oftentimes settle for alternative, the alternative that the devil offers, which is the work of the flesh, worry. Worry is a poor testimony to those that are observing our walk in the Lord. Know this for sure. Everybody's watching you. And it's not setting you on a pedestal, but they're watching how you act and react. Don't you? Don't you watch others, how they act and react to life circumstances? Don't you make judgments on their life and their walk with the Lord? People are making that with us, with you. They don't even have to know Christ, but they know the difference. They know there's a difference in our lives if we're walking with the Lord. And they're watching. The difference between living in peace and living in worry is found in our perspective. Again, how we look at it. Are we safe from harm in mind, spirit, or body? Or are we living in fear of our mind, our spirit, and our body? Do we have a cheerful, calm delight in all life circumstances? God is the true judge of what is good for us. Remember, we learned everything last week that God makes everything work together for our good. In Romans 8, 28 to those that are called according to his purpose. He knows what's right for us and what's good for us. He has plans for us. Persecutions in life will never bring us harm in God's eyes. Turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. First Peter chapter three. Verse thirteen. And who is he that will harm you if ye be followers of that which is good? But and if ye suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye. And be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. And be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and in fear. What's going to harm us if we follow that which is good? God is good. But if we, if and ye, but in, but and if ye suffer for righteousness sake, happy are ye. We're showing the joy during the suffering. And be not afraid. Neither be troubled. We view painful experiences as harmful, but God does not. Remember, the pain is fleshly. Mostly, that's what we feel. The loss of a parent, the loss of a friend, a loved one. The cutting words of a dear friend when they're not done in love hurt. But the Holy Spirit always leads us to be at peace. Let's look at Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4, verse 7. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Again, to have the peace of God, you have to know Christ. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, Whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. Those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me, do. And the God of peace shall be with you. God has established someone for you to follow, ways for you to see, 
And if your, your leaders are exhibiting these, these ones, or the ones that Paul <clears throat> exhibited to Timothy, and you see that in your leaders, follow, because you know the truth. And if we're teaching the truth, we're going to live by the truth. Remember, we cannot change the way we act until we, we change the way we think. The devil, and the devil's work begins on the outside, whereas God's work begins on the inside. So we've seen in our principle tonight, every sin has its origin in our heart. Romans chapter 12, and we'll close with this. Verse 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world, but ye be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. When you are transferred on the inside, you become conformed to Christ and you will be a new creature and you will prove the perfect will of God in your life. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Dear Lord, Father, we thank you once again for your word. Lord, we thank you for the greatness of the fruits of the Spirit that we can draw from the tree of righteousness. Lord, allow us to, to have these fruits, but not just for ourselves, that we may share the fruits with others that are around us. Lord, we pray for anybody in here that does not know you as your personal Savior, that does not have this relationship, that cannot know the perfect peace that you have for us. But Lord, we ask that you, you show them a way, that tonight's the night. They put away their selfishness, they put away themselves, and come to you, Lord, and ask you to come into their hearts, to forgive them of their unrighteousness, and to save them from eternity in hell. And they can have that relationship. They can awaken and quicken that spirit that can be alive with them and start fellowshipping with you. Lord, we thank you for peace, that we don't have fear of our spirit, our mind, and our body in this world anymore that, to those that are called upon you. Lord, we thank you for the fruits. Lord, we just ask you to transform us, be not conformed, to this world, but Lord, allow us to be new people, new creatures, and that we can give forth the testimony that you have for us. Lord, we pray these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen.